Good morning, good morning, City Walk Church. We're going to go ahead and get started with our worship service and get it started out with some music. So if you guys want to come on in, we're going to go ahead and sing some praise to the Lord together. So much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. whether you call City Walk home or you're visiting that you decided to make this part of your nice and toasty weekend. Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, if you are new here, if you're visiting, we would love 
to connect with you. We have these connect cards in the seats in front of you. We'd love for you to just take a second, fill out the few questions so that we could get to know you. Uh, we have a gift for you. So if you fill one of these out, we have the gift of coffee to give you, Dutch Bros or Starbucks, whatever you prefer. Um, and then for every card, we also donate $5 to a local organization in town called A Woman's Friend. So we'd love if you just took a couple seconds sometime throughout the service and filled that out. Uh, another really easy way to stay connected with CityWalk is just to download the app. It's a free download. If you search CityWalk Church in your app store, uh, there's uh, announcements that you can know everything that's going on at CityWalk. There's a place to track sermon notes, and there's also a Bible there. So we would love for you to download that so that you can stay connected. One thing that you'll find in there in the announcements is that this upcoming weekend, the 10th, we have the table. Usually we have it the first Monday of every month, but because of Labor Day, uh, we're gonna have it on Saturday. So it's gonna be a great time for women to get together. If you're 17 to 117, there's a place for you. It's gonna be a powerful weekend. We have some women who are gonna be sharing their stories. There's gonna be some good food and just a great time to connect. So we would love to have you there. And we are gonna go ahead and continue to worship this morning.
that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me to know his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. ransom me all oh, his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh is free indeed I'm a child child of God. 
Yes, I am. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are and for what you have done. We thank you that you have made us new and that you call us your own um, and that we are who you say that we are, Lord. We thank you so much for the gifts of your son and for just the teaching and the life he lived, knowing that, God, you love us and you care for us and you desire a relationship for us. And God, we pray that as the message is brought forth today, that we would continue to worship and just acknowledging who you are, Lord, your power and your presence. And God, I pray that you would um, bless this service, bless these people, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. going on beautiful people how we doing out there all right good morning good morning well welcome to city walk whether you're joining us here in person or online it's nice of you guys to join us this morning if i have not had the pleasure of meeting you my name is matt and i get to serve here as part of the teaching team um, here at city walk church which is really awesome um, so many of you guys know um, i'm not from yuba city Okay, but over the last seven or eight years, there's been a couple of things that have really grabbed my heart about living in this town. One of those things is the amount of people that grow fruit in their front and their backyard. Okay, like, no, y'all laughing, but I got four kids, and my kids love fruit. And ain't nothing like showing up somewhere and someone said, hey, coach, here's a bag of oranges. Take that home for your families. Run me them oranges. I'm taking these home. Right, oh, coach, here's a bag of peaches. Take those home. Like, the fact that so many people grow fruit and are so generous with just giving them away, it actually is a blessing to my family, and we appreciate you guys, right? And I've come to find out that it's kind of like a thing here. Like, several people actually grow fruit in their front backyard. Like, I'm not used to that. So I was like, you know what? I feel kind of left out. So during COVID, guess what I did? I started me an orchard in my backyard. Let me show you guys how it's going. See that? <laughs> Now, you're laughing because I know it looks like a stick, but there's supposed to be some cherries on that thing. I'm trying to figure out what happened. But come to find out, here's what happened. I've learned that the soil is actually a pretty big deal. Right? Like if, if you want to have a harvest of some fruit, you're probably going to have to take care of the soil. But here's the deeper question that I have for myself. Do I care enough to have a harvest to spend the time cultivating the soil? Yes. Maybe no. So because I don't tend to the soil, this is what I'm working with right here. So that's where I'm at. And some of you guys, you know exactly what I'm talking about because some of you guys garden. Some of you guys actually do farm. Or some of you guys are like what I call part-time farmers. You got like two trees in your backyard, whatever. But you guys know that, hey, if you want to have a harvest of some fruit in your backyard, you're going to have to tend to that soil, right? You're going to have to make sure that soil is nice. And the same thing is with, you know, I'm a coach, so I always try to bring things to relevance to some of my athletes. But same thing as, a, as an athlete, you know that, hey, the success of me as an athlete is dependent on my overall athleticism. So if I'm skipping out in the weight room, if I'm skipping out on speed training, I know there's going to be limitations to what I can actually do in my performance as an athlete, right? Or maybe you're a business person. And look, I've tried running businesses before, and I know that the tedious tasks of like working on all the administrative stuff, it sucks. It's annoying. But the success of your business is actually predicated on how well you do those things and take care of that part of your business. Well, the same thing is in our faith, right? There are some things that might be challenging as we grow in our faith, but really the essence of our growth has to do with the condition of our heart, right? And so 
we're going to look at uh, a parable that Jesus taught. And it's a, a very, very difficult and challenging parable. We're going to get through this today, and I think it's really going to encourage us and bless us. And if you don't know what a parable is, a parable is basically a simple story that has spiritual meaning, right? And Jesus was the perfect, I, I call him an MC. If you guys know what an MC is, go back to the 90s. MCs were like people who rap. But Jesus, had a, he was like a wordsmith. He would say stuff, and people understand what it meant for a little bit, like on the surface level. But then they go back and be like, dang, that had a double meaning. Dang, Jesus is deep. So Jesus in this parable is like really spitting some stuff that's really crucial for us. But most of the people that heard it, they only saw what he was saying on the surface. But we're going to unpack this thing today. You guys with me? All right, cool. So before we hop in, this thing is really important. Jesus said out of his own mouth, that this is one of the most important teachings for us to grab hold of. One of the, he even says it like this. He says, if we can't understand this parable, like if we don't understand what he's saying in this parable, how do we expect to understand all his other teachings? Like this is like, if you could put in a priority list, like unpacking this and understanding this is crucial. Not because I said so, but because those are the words of Jesus. He said, this is a super important parable for you to understand. And so what Jesus does, what he does is he takes in this parable four different types of soil, right? And he relates those four types of soil to four different people's hearts, right? And so he uses kind of agricultural terminology to talk about the soil, but really he has a deeper meaning of people's hearts. And it's important that as we unpack this, that we go into this realizing one really important thing, that as Jesus is talking about these soils, only one of these soils is a heart that is saved, redeemed, and has a home in heaven. And so it's really important that as we track along with this, that we're paying attention to the soil that Jesus says is one of his and that has a home in eternity. So where we are in this text, uh, you know, Jesus used to travel a lot and do ministry everywhere. And he had his, uh, you know, his squad with him, his 12 disciples. And so they were going around town to town and they were teaching about the kingdom. And he got to this place called Galilee that had like a, you know, a little sea, a little waterfront area. And as he shows up, people just start coming out the woodworks, you know, Jesus is here, y'all. Hey, man, that's Jesus over there. And so people just started to kind of flood the area, you know, coming from over there, coming from over there. And so in my mind, like, things kind of move in my mind, kind of like a movie when I read the Bible. So I'm like, man... I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever been on a vacation to a beach, like maybe you've been to like Mexico somewhere, the Bahamas, Santorini, and you just look down the shoreline, you see like hundreds and thousands of people. Well, imagine Jesus shows up at the beach, and all of a sudden, folks is like, hey, bro, ain't that Jesus? Hey, man, that is Jesus. And folks just start showing up, showing up. And then all of a sudden, you look out, and there's hundreds to thousands of people. This is what happened. And so Jesus finds himself in the midst of this crowd, and in the midst of this crowd, because Jesus is all-knowing, he knows that there's some people in this crowd because, A, they heard that this dude just fed 5,000 people, so they like, get me a meal. I heard Jesus feeds everybody, y'all. Let's run it. Come on, come on. Jesus is over there. Maybe we get some bread and some fish or something. Let's find out, right? And he also knows some people were there just because they saw a crowd, so they're like, well, let's just go find out what's going on over there, right? But then there were some people in the audience who were there because they wanted to know him. They wanted to know his teachings. They wanted to know his father. They were there because they actually wanted to tune in to the words that Jesus had to say. So in the midst of this big crowd, he knew that there was a wide spectrum of why people were here. Maybe their wife dragged him out of bed and said, we're going to go to church today. I'm not telling on nobody this morning, though. I ain't, I ain't walking up in your house, okay? I'm going to leave that alone. So Jesus is here, and he begins to teach the people this parable that we're going to unpack. So we're going to hop into Luke chapter 8, and we're going to start at verse 4. And this is what it says. A large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from every town. He said in the parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Now, do, do we have any farmers in here? Just throw our hands up. Do we have any farmers in here? Okay, cool, cool. How about some part-time farmers? 
You know, people that say you got a couple of trees. Okay, so you guys kind of understand like agricultural references, right? Well, Jesus specifically used this because the people he was talking to, like the ag life was what they knew. It was not uncommon to them. A lot of these people were farmers. That's what they did for a living. And so Jesus had a way of making all of his teachings relevant to what people were going through. So when he's using this, for some of us, like myself, that have never farmed in in a day of their life, like some of us might be like, okay, like what? Seed, soil? But for all these people, they were like, bro, I know exactly what you're talking about, Jesus, because that's all I do is farm all day, right? And so he's teaching these people in a way that really grips their heart because they know about it. And so um, I can see people, and I got problems, guys, okay? I got problems. My problem is, like, whenever I translate the Bible in my brain, it's always, like, me and my boys hanging out with Jesus. So, like, it's, like, me, Kenny, Tyson, D. Lo State. So when I read Jesus, I see my boys, like, y'all, like, y'all heard that? Like, Jesus actually spitting bars. Like, that's how, that's how I translate it. So then here's the thing. When Jesus says that the seed fell on the path and it got trampled on and the birds came and ate it, the people in the crowd were like probably leaning in because they're like, yeah, you know, like that happened. I know exactly what you're talking about. I just threw some seed out the other day. And next thing you know, I saw a bird come get it. I know what you're talking about, Jesus. I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you. But then he goes on to verse 6, and this is what he says. He says, some other seed fell on rocks. And when it grew up, it withered away since it lacked moisture. And again, I can see me and all my boys like, huh? know what you're talking about right there, Jesus. Like the disciples and all the people in the crowd, like they knew what he was talking about. Like, yeah, like that happens. That does happen, the rocks. Because what was common in the area where they were farming was there's actually this uh, particular rock called a black basalt rock, right? And you probably see a picture of it in just a second. So this black basalt rock was kind of scattered all across their land. So what the farmers would have to do, they didn't have the machinery that we have today. They actually would have to go through and get all these black basalt rocks out of their soil before they scattered their seed. Because if they didn't, those rocks would tear up all the, or take all the moisture that the seed would be getting, and it would choke out the seed so that way the seed couldn't grow. And so sometimes those farmers would do a good job clearing out all the rocks. But even if they had some small pieces of rock in the soil, those small pieces of rock were enough to take all the moisture from the seed and prevent the seed from growing. And so what happened is when there were small pieces of, of rock in the soil, the seed would never take root. So it would wither and die because it did not take root. And so then in verse 7, Jesus goes on. Like I said, these are all farmers. So like right now, you might be like, bro, what? Huh? But these guys were all tuning in because they knew what he was talking about. In verse 7, Jesus talks about another soil. And he says, other seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up with it and then choked it out. Now, again, on the surface, people in the crowd knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Like, yeah, man, like, yeah, I have to clear out those thorns all the time. Like, yeah, yeah. So they were kind of tracking with him on the surface. But very few of them knew what he was actually talking about in terms of the kingdom of God. And these thorns that Jesus is talking about, they're synonyms for like thistles and weeds. And those weeds, those thorns, those thistles, they were dangerous to the growth of the seed. And if a farmer didn't do a good job cultivating the soil and getting out those thorns and pulling out those weeds and all that stuff, eventually the desired harvest that that farmer had would be compromised because the soil was not tended to and there was these thorns that were choking it out. And now I don't know about you, but in my family, it was like a non-questionable thing to go to grandma and grandpa's house and pick weeds. Like, it didn't matter what age you were, my grandparents had this really big uh, flower bed in front of the house, like no joke, probably as big as this stage, And it was beautiful. Like, my grandpa did a good job, like, you know, planting some flowers and stuff like this. But here's the thing. You know who was picking them weeds around them flowers? This guy. And all my brothers and all my cousins. But here's the thing. My grandpa knew that if I want these flowers in this garden to stay looking nice, 
I'm going to need somebody to come and make sure that this soil stays cultivated. I'm going to have to make sure that these thorns, these thistles, and all this stuff gets cleared out so that way the desired garden that I want is what I get. And so tending to that soil was super important because if we didn't pull those weeds, you'd drive by my grandpa's house one day, and those weeds would overtake that entire garden, and it just wouldn't look nice. And we all know that. The people in the crowd knew that because they were farmers, and this was something that was not foreign to them. But then Jesus goes on to one more soil. In verse 8, he says this, still another seed fell on good ground. When it grew up, it produced fruit a hundred times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. So it fell on good ground that produced a hundred times what was sown, right? So this good ground was the cultivated, healthy soil. This was the soil that you put a little bit of TLC in. You made sure that it was nice and ready and prepared. This wasn't soil that you just walked outside and threw a tree from Home Depot in the ground and said, all right, about to give me some cherries. No, nah, this wasn't that kind of soil. This was soil that you actually spent time getting out those rocks, looking inside the soil. Oh, there's a thorn right there. Let me pull that out. There's a weed right there. This was soil that was really, that really intentional about being uh, prepared for the seed. And what we learn from this on the surface is something obvious, that good soil brings a good harvest. And that wasn't difficult for the people to understand. Like I said, they were farmers, so they knew that. Like, yeah, good soil, good harvest. Gotcha, Jesus. Very cool. But not all of them knew what he was really trying to say. So his disciples, like they did many times, if you read through the scriptures, the disciples would always kind of walk away from one of Jesus' teachings and be like, bro, you know what he meant? Nah, bro, I don't know what the heck he was talking about. He's talking about some uh, soil. and see, I don't know what he's talking about. But the disciples, they went and they asked them because that's what they did. So in verse 9, they actually went and they asked Jesus, bro, what were you really trying to say? We know there had to be a deeper meaning than just some farming stuff. And so in verse 9, it says this. Then his disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? So he said, look, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given, to, given for you to know, but to the rest... It is in parables, so that looking, they might not see, and hearing, they may not understand. And so that was Jesus' way of saying, look, the people have to want to know what I'm talking about. If they're there just because there's a crowd, if they're there just to see a miracle, if they're there just because they got drug out of bed, if they're there just because they heard I fed some people, then it's going to go in one ear and out the other ear. But if they're there to know me, if they're there to hear my words, if they're here to know my father, they're going to understand. As for you guys, y'all my boys. <laughs> I'm going to make sure you guys understand because I can't have you going out there not knowing what I'm saying because y'all my boys. Right? And so I need y'all to know what I'm saying. So then Jesus goes on and he explains to the disciples what he was really trying to say to the crowd. And so in verse 11, let's hop back in here. Now Jesus is explaining it to his disciples, his boys. Me, D'Lo, Stacey, Kenya, all my boys I grew up with, right? We're hanging out with Jesus. All right, and he says in verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable right here, guys. You ready? Y'all ready? This is the meaning of the parable. We ready? Yeah. Here we go. Somebody's ready. The seed is the word of God, right? And I can see the disciples like, dang, bro, that's deep, Jesus. So the seed is the word of God? Okay, okay. So that means the soil must be my heart. Okay, dang, this is getting deep, Jesus. Okay, I thought this was just some farmer stuff you were trying to teach me. But okay, so the seed is the word of God. Got that. And in verse 12, Jesus goes on. He begins to break this down even more. And he says, hey, so check it out, guys. Y'all with me? The seed is the word. And then he says, the seed along the path are those that have heard the word, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and so that they may not be saved. So the heart is hardened to the truth, and as a result, the seed can't take root. So the heart is hardened to the truth, and as a result, 
the seed can't take root and allow an individual to be saved and take root into Jesus. So if your heart is hard, it can't take root. But if your heart is soft, the seed can take root. And so it's an important question for us to figure out what keeps our hearts hard. And so this is not an exhaustive list, but over my years, and I'm still a rookie at this thing, but I've been walking with the Lord since 2008. And so two things in my personal journey and with like getting to know other people um, and learning about their journey, two things that I think are very, very real that keep us from having a soft heart. And those things are pride and skepticism. So here's what I mean by pride. The prideful heart says this. I don't need to be saved, man. That's for the people that really got problems. You know what I'm saying? Like, my life is all right. You know what I'm saying? I got my education, my eyes clean. I got my car. I'm just not looking. I'm looking at my life is not really that messy. But that dude over there, bruh, he needs Jesus. Like, for real needs Jesus. And so that, that prideful heart is like, I don't, there's nothing, I don't need to change anything. And this is what the prideful heart does. The prideful heart measures against the people around them versus measuring at the Savior who is perfect. And so that prideful heart looks around and says, yeah, I'm a little better than that person, a little better than that person, a little better than that person. I don't really need Jesus, but they do. Shoot. All right? And then the skeptic, the skeptical heart is the heart that, is always trying to lean heavily into the things that we don't know versus leaning into the things that we don't know. So the skeptical heart is the heart that hears the message of Jesus, but then immediately goes, bro, did he really rise from the dead, though? That's too much, bro. You're telling me this cat really rise from the dead? So they hear the message, and they immediately bounce back to something that, like, but maybe that didn't happen. And so they lean into the parts that they don't understand rather than leaning into what we do understand. And here's what we do understand, people. There is historical documentation that Jesus walked this earth, that Jesus did miracles, that Jesus was crucified, and that Jesus resurrected. Over 500 people saw him after he resurrected. Documentation scattered all over the world of people who saw him after he resurrected. So just as real as World War I was and that we have in our history books is just as real as the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. You can go research it. You can look for it. It has never been proven to be false. But the skeptical heart goes, yeah, I don't know. I just don't know. And as a result, our hearts stay hard. But Jesus ain't done yet. So let's hop back into verse 13, and he keeps on explaining this, unpacking this for his disciples. Verse 13, he says, and the seed on the rock, that's those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. Like, dang, man, Jesus the boy, man, he cool, Jesus my homie. But having no root, these believe for a while and then they fall away in a time of testing. So having no root means that they were not in a real relationship with Jesus. They were earshot. They heard the message. They said, oh, that sounds good. Jesus is a good God. I want to follow his teaching. But they didn't take root and grab onto Jesus in a relationship. So they were hearing, but they weren't understanding to a point where transformation took place. And from my personal experience, and again, just in a couple of years of walking with the Lord, this is what I liken the soil with the rocks to. The biggest thing I believe, now it might be something different. Like I said, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I think one of the biggest things in the heart of the soil who has the rocks is this, fear of people and what they will think. I think if we're all a little honest with ourselves, when God calls us to make a righteous move, to stand up for righteousness, to stand on the word, to live a little different, a lot of times it, it gets challenged by our fear of what people will think. Because, you know, in the back of our head, we're like, we want to be a perfect blend of like, I don't want to be a Jesus freak that people make fun of, but I also kind of want to make friends with the world a little bit and have my friends still think that I'm cool. So like, I want to be all in with Jesus, but I still want to be cool. I want to make a difference in the world, but I also still want the world to like me. I want to, and then, and then I want to, huh? and so those are the people with the rock. And really what it boils down to is we're too afraid 
of what people will think when we stand for righteousness and let our lives take root into the message and the movement of Jesus. And I think I've shared this with you guys before. Maybe, maybe not. I got bad memories, so sometimes I share the same stories like 600 times. Ask my athletes. They're like, Coach, you said this story like six times. Come on, what are you doing here? But anyways, I think I've shared this with you guys. But there was a period in my life um, when I graduated high school, I was like 18, 19, and I knew God was real, but I wasn't saved. Now, hear me on this. I grew up in church. My daddy is a pastor. I heard the message for several, several years out of my life. And God had did things around my life to get my attention. God had done things and placed people in my life and got my attention in certain ways to let me know that he was real. But just because I knew he was real, I actually still was not saved because I was afraid to give up sin. I was afraid to give up popularity. I was afraid to give up my identity. And as a result, this is what I did. I lived in this crazy cycle of guilt, shame, and conviction because I knew God was real. He did a good job letting me know that he's real by different things he did in my life, right? But as I was like going on, I was like, man, but if I stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing that, my boys are going to look at me crazy. People are going to think I'm different. They're going to start calling me Holy Roller, Bible Basher, all this stuff. And so what I did is I get back amongst my friends, and instead of standing on the reality that I knew Jesus was real, I would revert back to just doing what my friends would do. So when I'm around them, I'm saying every four-letter word that you could think of out of the book. And then when I get around these people, I'm like, yeah, praise God, he's real. And then I get around my friends over here, and I'm like, man, let's turn up. Uh, let's turn up. And then I get around these people, I'm like, and says so all this back and forth. And why it came down to I was afraid of what people would say about me. And it hurt my heart. And I'm sure it hurt his heart. Because at the end of the day, I was afraid of people more than I was afraid of him. And that's what happens with the soil that has the rocks. We're afraid of what people will think about us. And during that time in my life, I remember reading a scripture that messed me up. I read this scripture, and it's one of those you read that and you're like, bruh, I can't even argue that. It's straightforward. <laughs> so I'm going to read John chapter 12, verse 25, man. And this is what it says. It says Jesus talking to the crowd. And he says this in John 12, 25, the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And basically in that moment, God spoke to me. He said this, if your status among your friends, your acceptance among your peers, and your desire for popularity, if that is more important than righteousness, you can kiss eternity goodbye. If it's more important for you to be accepted in the people in your circle than it is of living righteously and letting my word transform your life, you can kiss eternity goodbye. And that's what Jesus is telling his people. But if you realize that a relationship with Jesus is the most important thing on this earth, then you won't care about what other people think and you'll follow Jesus into eternity. That's what Jesus was saying in John chapter 12, verse 25. And I remember reading that and being like, bruh, Jesus, that's a hard word right there. You're telling me if I love my life and I love my friends and I love them. But cut clear, plain and simple. And so let's hop back into this because Jesus isn't done yet. He's still unpacking this. But his disciples, man, if you can imagine, his disciples are leaning in like, I did not know, Jesus, that what you just said about that seed and that soil meant all of this. Whoa. And his disciples are probably like, Phew. right? But then he's still unpacking this. Let's hop back into verse 14. He says, as for the seed that fell among the thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, they go on their way and are choked out with the worries, they're choked out with wanting riches, they're choked out with wanting the pleasures of life, and they produce no mature fruit. And verse 15 says, but the seed, the seed and the good ground, these are the ones who having heard the word with an honest and good heart, they hold on to the word, and by enduring, 
they produce fruit. So the soil with the thorns, it never takes root to the seed because of the strong devotion to material things. And if you're familiar with the Bible, this is the, the rich young ruler who Jesus challenges his heart to his possessions. And he says, yeah, you've done a lot of good things, but if you, if you really want what I'm asking, go sell your possessions. And he couldn't do it because of his strong devotion to his possessions. And what happens is um, the riches and the pleasure and the pursuit of all these things, it clouds our understanding of what is most important. And what Jesus is saying is most important is our relationship with him and following him. And so I look at my life, I look at our lives, and some of the things that the thorns could symbolize in our hearts are these. Education, careers, riches. Now, none of these things are bad in and of itself, but what Jesus is challenging, is, challenging us is what is truly the number one spot in our heart? What is truly the main pursuit of our heart? Is the main pursuit of our heart Jesus, or is the main pursuit of our heart the education then Jesus? The career, the comfort, the wealth, the nice house, and then Jesus? Or is it the, the pleasure, and, the, and then Jesus? And Jesus is saying, the number one thing needs to be my relationship with you. And so, in that same little context, he also talks about the mature fruit. So what is the mature fruit? You know, we got to kind of break down some of these things because, you know, mature fruit, like what does that mean? I'll tell you what mature fruit isn't, isn't the orchard in my backyard. <laughs> That's not the mature fruit, right? But that mature fruit is that evidence of a transformed heart. So where does the evidence of a transformed heart come from? The transformed heart comes from when the heart takes root to the seed which is the word of God, and as a result of latching on to the word of God, it produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. As a kid who grew up in church, I knew the fruits of the Spirit, and in my mind, I thought I was supposed to pretend to have the fruits of the Spirit. So I thought, oh, as a Christian, I'm supposed to be loving. I'm supposed to be joyful. I'm supposed to be peaceful. But what I didn't realize is those are the manifestations of latching on to the word of God. When you latch on, that's what gets produced. It's not about pretending you have those things. It's about allowing the word to transform your heart. And as a result, you walk around with more joy than anybody can understand. You walk around with more peace than anybody can understand because that word is doing something inside of you that people can't see on the inside, but they see when they look at your life. And so we know this. I want you guys to say this to yourself. Mature fruit comes from good soil. And this is God's will for me. Like, it's not just God's will for the people who preach up here. And sometimes we think that, yeah, his life is supposed to look different because he's preaching the word. No, this is for all of us. This ain't for the pastor, for the preacher, for the people who actually do stuff on Sunday morning. This is a message that Jesus wants all of us to grasp. That mature fruit comes from good soil. And this is God's will for me, for you, for us that we will walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. So after unpacking these scriptures, like I said, his disciples are probably like, Jesus is deep as a mug, right? But I think we can find ourselves, if we're honest, we can find ourselves in one of those four soils. Maybe we're on the path. Maybe our heart reflects the rocks. Maybe our heart reflects the thorns and Jesus, like we think Jesus is important, but he's not number one in our spot, or maybe we're the good soil. But I think God does a really good job, whether you're here in person or watching online, God does a good job of letting us know exactly where we are with him. You know what I mean? Like he makes it really, really clear. Now, it might not be comfortable when he's speaking to your heart and your heartbeat goes, start speeding up because you know Jesus is talking to you, but he does a really good job of letting us know where we really are with him. And like I said earlier, it's one thing to hear what God is speaking to our heart, and it's another thing to allow what we hear to transform our heart. And so we can be honest. For some of us, because I know 
even to this day, there's sometimes when that response that Jesus is trying to get from us, it's a little scary. That's faith, right? Like, we don't know what's on the other side of that. Like, I feel Jesus is calling me to X, Y, Z. I feel God is calling me a little bit deeper. I feel like God is calling me to actually just accept him. And, and on the other side of that, there's just like this, but I just don't know. And it's a little scary, and we might be a little hesitant, and we might want to wrestle, and we hope that, like, that, that feeling in our heart just subsides, like, bro, let's just get out of church real quick and go back home because I need to get back to my regular life, start watching some football because Jesus is doing something in my heart, and it is not comfortable at all. Been there. I know what you guys are going through. But here's the thing. In my life, what I've realized is remembering who God is helps me trust him when I hear his call. Remembering who God is is what helps me say yes when I hear his call. And so here's what I mean. There's two scriptures that really encourage me. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this. A thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy I have come, Jesus says, so that you may have life and have it abundance. Everything that Jesus tries to do in your heart is actually his way of inviting you to this abundant life. So when Jesus is stirring up in your heart, consider an invitation to experience the abundant life. But apart from listening and following Jesus, there is no abundant life. So we can hear, we can hear, we can hear, but when we latch on and when we follow, that's when we see the abundant life take place. And here's another one that encourages me. Psalm 23. Y'all know y'all heard this one. Whether you've been to church or not, you've heard this one. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his namesake. Now, when David's writing this, man, he wasn't writing this for some poetry slam. Like, this wasn't some rap battle competition. He's like, oh, I need, I need to write something that sounds dope. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I have what I want. No, 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 that's not what he's doing here. David is actually writing things that he has personally experienced about God within his relationship with God. And the things that David is writing about, leading me by quiet waters, renewing my life. These are things that David experienced, and these are things that God wants us to experience as well. So when I hear God's voice, I'm reminded that God is leading me to a place of abundance internally. God is leading me to a place where he wants to fill me with love, joy, peace. So that helps me to respond in faith saying, God, this might be a challenging situation for me to adapt my life to, but I know on the other side you've got something for me. So again, if you're here today or you're listening online and you feel God kind of taking your heart into action, um, there's a few things that I think uh, will help us in this. So whether you're in the path, the rock, thorns, you know, we can find ourselves, right? But no matter where we are, I think here's some practical things that we can do after reading this parable. Really practical things. One, if God hasn't already shown you, ask him, Lord, what soil am I? I mean, it's cool. Matt's up there getting all animated, all excited, trying to tell me about these soil and the rocks and the. But no, ask him, like, Lord, where am I in this thing? Because we're all in there somewhere. Ask him, right? After you ask him, then acknowledge. Acknowledge what? Acknowledge what is keeping us from taking root in Jesus. Because like I said, this is the only one that has a home in eternity. And that's hard to grasp, but that's what Jesus is saying. These have not taken root. These have not gotten into a relationship with Jesus. These ones, their heart have not been transformed. There's no home and glory for them. This is the only one. So when we think about it, when we look at it, we have to acknowledge what is keeping me from taking root in Jesus and then accept God's plan for your life. As scary as it may be. I mean, when I was young, I used to think that accepting Jesus meant I'm automatically going to Africa and serving out there in the woods. Right? No, that ain't it. And some of us think that, I can't say yes to Jesus because next thing you know, he's going to have my whole family be moving overseas. Nah, 
Don't let all that be the issue. Just think and be honest with yourself about where you are and have you latched on. Have you taken root into your relationship with Jesus? And some of us, you know what I'm saying, we, we've been going on dates with Jesus every Sunday morning from 10 to 11, 15. And Jesus is like, bro, I'm ready for a committed relationship. Because <laughs> these hour and 15 minute dates, man, they get a little, you know what I'm saying, I'm ready for this to get real. It's time for you to take root and allow Jesus to transform your heart. And if you've been around City Walk for a while, you've heard us say this phrase, and we mean it with all of our heart. We want to walk with people into a growing relationship with Jesus. So no matter where you find yourself, this is a place where we want to walk with you into a growing relationship with Jesus. I don't care. We don't care what you did yesterday, what you did in the parking lot. We want to walk with people, love on people, teach people, and have a lot of fun in the process while we walk with people into growing, into a, into growing, a growing relationship with Jesus. And so here's something. If you're part of City Walk body, if you're like, man, this is my home church. I love City Walk. Matt's crazy. His kids are cute, but he's crazy. This is something that I think is important for all of us to accept. And what I think Jesus really wants us to understand. Our life should encourage someone to want to follow Jesus. Period. Your life should want or should encourage somebody to want to follow Jesus. One of my pastors used to always say, when's the last time somebody wanted to go deeper in their faith because they knew you? When's the last time somebody wanted to have a relationship with Jesus because they knew you? When's the last time somebody looked at your life and was like, I'm encouraged in my faith because of the way that he lived? And the truth of the matter is, is that's God's will for us, is that our lives should encourage someone to want to follow Jesus. Your spouse should be encouraged by your relationship. Your children should be encouraged as they grow old to see, man, my daddy's love for God is real. It's sincere. The way my mom goes after God, it's real. It's sincere. The people you work with, your friends at school, there should be something that has them saying, maybe I should ask about Jesus a little bit. So, this is the biggest moment of the service. Biggest moment. We heard, and just like Jesus looked out to the crowd and he knew, uh, some people are here because they saw a crowd. Some people are here because they know that I fed 5,000 people. Some people are here, yeah, because they know that I've been doing miracles. I've been giving sight to the blind. I've been allowing the lame to walk. But then he also knew that there were some that were here in that crowd, in that midst of hundreds and thousands of people, that they want to know me. They, they want to know my word. They want to know my father. But it boils down to a decision. And God is a gentleman. He ain't going to force himself on us and be like, you better. Right? One of the scriptures says, behold, he stands at the door and he knocks. Just knocking at the door of our heart. And some of us, we're going, hey, Jesus, I hope it ain't cold out there because I ain't ready. I ain't ready to open up that door. Right? But he stands and he knocks and he waits. And I'm reminded of that cycle that I went through, knowing God was real, feeling him try to call me into a real relationship with him, but fearing man. Worried about what people were thinking, whatever it may be, but all the things that kept me from just being 100% all in and giving my life to Jesus. But don't leave today without giving God the response that you believe he's looking for in your heart. Because guess what? He going to keep knocking. He going to keep knocking. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, 
We are grateful for your word, Lord. Your word, God, is the seed that gives us life. Just like those farmers knew, they wanted a harvest of a hundred times fold. They didn't want a barren tree in their backyard. They wanted fruit upon fruit upon fruit upon fruit. Your desire for us, God, is that we would accept you as Lord and Savior, latch on to your word, and allow your word to transform us from the inside, bringing forth more fruit than we ever imagined, more peace than we've ever imagined, more joy in our life than we ever imagined, more love, more self-control. So, Father, I pray that you would keep speaking. And if you're here today or you're listening online, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that very easily right where you're sitting. In the quietness of your heart, you're really just agreeing with what God is already saying. I'm a broken, lost sinner. I have not lived according to your ways, Lord. And I believe, Jesus, that you are the antidote and the savior of my soul. That you are the answer to this brokenness that I experience this lostness. And just by agreeing in your heart and inviting Jesus in and saying, Jesus, I need you. I've heard, I sense you calling me, Jesus. Just saying yes and inviting him into your heart and opening up that door and latching on and allowing the word to take root. You can walk out of here today knowing that God has forgiven you, has redeemed you, and that that word is and will always transform you into a way that brings forth internal abundance. And if you're here today and maybe you're like, man, I've made that step. I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But maybe you've had some challenges come up over the years. Maybe you've had some challenges come up over the months. My encouragement to you and God, my prayer for your people is that you would eliminate distractions, that we would go after you like never before. That we wouldn't make up an excuse, but that we would make an opportunity. If it means waking up early, if it means shuffling some things around in our schedule, but Father, that we would allow your seed to transform us on the inside like never before. Father, we love you. Thank you for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Church family, we want to end today out as we do every week and just praying and singing together. And if you need to, while you're sitting there, take a moment just to pray and have a moment between you and the Lord. Take that moment and pray with him. If you want to come forward, you can pray up here if you want. If you want to pray with somebody, you can come up and pray with somebody. Luke is up here and would love to pray with you and talk with you. And but we would, our desire is that you walk in a closer relationship with the Lord. And hey, it starts with prayer. So sing with us, pray with us. Let's rejoice. Stand with us as we sing.
I don't wanna be afraid. I don't wanna be afraid. I don't wanna fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't wanna fear the storm. I don't wanna fear the storm. Peace be still, say the word. I'm not gonna be afraid, cause these ways are only worse. I'm not gonna be afraid, I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna fear the storm, you are greater than its roar. I'm not gonna fear the storm. seated. The peace that we sung about is one of the things that, as Matt talked about, a transform life, that in the midst of a crazy world, we can still experience peace, and we're so thankful for that. As we continue on in worship, one of the ways that we worship here at City Walk is we worship through our giving, and if you're visiting or maybe you're new to our gathering, this is not a time for you. But for those of us that call City Walk home, this is a way that we give through City Walk to minister and impact our community. Scripture tells us that when we give, we're not to give uh, out of guilt, but we're to give cheerfully. And I'm so thankful for the many generous people in our church that give cheerfully 
on a regular basis so that we can minister to children each week, so that we can help people with their electric bills when they don't have money for them. We can help people and serve in our community in very tangible ways just to be a help. And so if you want to give, you can give in two ways. You can give online or you can give in the offering basket in the back with one of the envelopes. Uh, here at City Walk, we have a lot going on this, this uh, really this week. And actually, the fun starts on Wednesday. The fun starts this Wednesday. We are having our family night. Yes. So there's going to be something. Usually we have our students here, our middle school and high schoolers, but we have something for everyone. So your kids, for you adults, for our students, it's going to be a great time. And you're teaching. Yeah. So I actually have two assignments on Wednesday night. My assignment is to get all the different kinds of Oreos and so bring those Oreos. for our snack. There's all... you. Do research. Google how many kinds of Oreos there are. You will be surprised. Uh, so I'm going to bring those, and then I'm going to be teaching on the hardest person to lead is me. So we're going to talk about self-leadership. And so we want to see you come out on Wednesday. And then next Sunday, we have a really, really big weekend plan. We're starting a brand new series called Winning at Home. And it's a series that we're going to talk about how you position your family for God's best. And so whether you're single, whether you're married, a grandparent, this is a series that's going to be helpful for all of us. And in fact, on your way out, we want to encourage you to pick up an invite card because every person you know wants to win at home. Yes. Every single one of them. And so invite them to come. And not only that, not only is it going to be fun for us, it's going to be a great applicable message for everyone, but we're kicking off. It's win at home. It's all about family. So we have something planned for kids as well. We have oh, a yeah. really fun event. It's called a fast car event. So it's going to be Hot Wheels racing. There's a huge course. It's, it's going to be, be really I'm fun. actually a little afraid to tell you about it, adults, because you won't come in here. You'll go to the kids in ministry next weekend. But we have a 30-foot electronic track where our kids are going to like race Hot Wheels while we're in here learning about Jesus. And so they're going to learn about Jesus too. But it's going to be a fun weekend for everybody. And there's also, if you're new to City Walk next week, we have our intro to City Walk lunch. So if you're new, maybe you started coming, you're like, hey, how do I get connected? Right after church next week, 15 minutes after we provide lunch, child care, you come, we, you learn a little bit more about City Walk, how to get connected and get your questions answered. So it's a lot, but they're not going to remember yeah. any of that. So no, what are we going to do? I mean, if you heard lunch and you stopped listening, because that's what I do at this time yeah. of day, uh, we have a whole sheet for you. We have all of the events for fall coming up. You're going to grab one of those as you leave. So it's going to talk about exactly what we talked about next yep. weekend, the table, everything coming up. Stick it on your fridge. Don't forget. Yeah, we got a big fall. So on your way out, pick those up. If we can help you, come see us at the Next Steps table. Have an awesome weekend and try to, try to stay cool as hard as that's going to be. So have a good weekend. See you Wednesday.